Good morning, Sharon, or I should say evening, whenever you're watching this. We heard it is your 80th birthday, so the folks at Ephesus Baptist Church want to do something very special for you. So, Pam, if you can start us off. Oh, sing a cappella, she can't do it. We're going to sing, I'm sorry, no music today. Um, so we're going to sing happy birthday to you, and the church is going to follow me, but y'all have got to carry it because I can't sing a lick. Y'all ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sharon. Happy birthday to you. Happy 80th birthday. I hope you have a wonderful day. All right, let's open our Bibles, church, to Luke chapter 19. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, turn with me in Luke chapter 19. As the kids came in and brought these palm leaves, do you all know what today is? Do you know what the significance of that is? This came, Christ came into Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of things that, that go with this, but I'm going to share something that I don't think I've shared with this church before. I've shared parts of it, but we're going to look at why this was such a big deal. Um, Jesus has been staying away from Jerusalem for quite a while in his ministry. They have sought to kill him. Now, let me tell you something. If you are watching, um, well, I know y'all aren't, but your kids are. If your kids are watching Instagram and TikTok and those types of things, they are doing what they call deconstructing Christianity. They are, they're not shy anymore. They're attacking it. And one of the attacks that they're doing is Jesus never claimed to be God. That's not what it means. The Son of God doesn't mean God and all this stuff. And most of these kids don't have the arguments because they're too busy flipping through TikTok rather than doing research. So I'm noticing something with our young people. They see something on TikTok, it's true. Now we laugh, but some of y'all see stuff on Facebook and it's true. So we're really being conditioned by our media. But the reason they want to kill Jesus is very clear in our Bible. Because him being a man claims to be God. Did y'all know that's why he was killed? That's why he was killed. That's why he was crucified. The Jews knew that. His disciples picked up on that. Everybody picked up on that. But we're living in a culture now that's just trying to deconstruct this. And so they were going to kill him. He stayed away from Jerusalem. But this day, Palm Sunday, he is going to come into Jerusalem with fanfare. And it is the first time that he's coming in with them all recognizing this is the Messiah. He's going to be coming in through a, a place that earlier Lazarus had been raised from the dead. There's a half a million pilgrims of Jews and god fears that are coming in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Do we know what Passover is? The celebration of Passover? See, Baptists celebrate with food. We just need an excuse. Jews celebrated with purpose. And so Passover was the celebration of when they were delivered from Egypt where God had picked his servant Moses and Moses came in and said, let my people go. And there was a battle between Pharaoh and God. And God would do a powerful work and Pharaoh would say no. And God would say, send Moses, let my people go. And Pharaoh would say no. And God would do another powerful work. And the last work, the last sign, the last miracle was a warning that God gave them. And Moses begged. And the firstborn of everything in Egypt, sheep, goats, cows, dogs, mice, children, would perish if Pharaoh didn't let them go. And Pharaoh, in his willfulness, said, ha, no. God had given them a sign, something to do. They were to offer up a lamb. They were to sacrifice it and take the blood of that. Now listen, God's not a bloodthirsty God. He's a, very, he's a teaching God. He's trying to teach us something through the entire Bible. But if we did blood on the doorframe here, it'd be like this. But the doorframes back then were built different. There was a beam that came down here, a beam that came down here, and a beam that went across. So if they put blood on the corners of the door like that, it formed a what? Cross. 
Now they didn't know that. The cross hadn't even been invented yet as an execution device. So they put blood on the door, and as the angel of death came into Egypt, wherever that angel saw the blood covered the door, that house was protected, and nobody in it would perish. Now, we've been studying Romans. That was an act of what? Faith. If you were an Egyptian, and you believed that, and you put blood over your door, what would happen to your household? The, the, he would pass. God's trying to show them something pretty powerful. And, and after that, they left. And so what the Jews would do is every year they would come and celebrate Passover, and they'd sacrifice a lamb. They would have a meal that taught them what that experience was for those that were before them. It was a family affair and a national affair. It was a big deal. And it's coming up on Passover. Your Bible... All the information we really have of Jesus is found really in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's other parts, but the crux of what we know about Christ is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's 89 chapters of information. If you read one chapter a day in three months, you would read the entire four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you read three chapters a day, you'll read all four in a month. But I want to share something interesting I don't know if you've ever thought about. Out of those 89 chapters, only four deal with his early life, his childhood. 85 chapters deal with the last three and a half years of his life. Out of those 85, 29 deal with the last week. And 13 of those 85 concentrate on the last 24 hours. This event, Palm Sunday, is recorded in all four Gospels. It's a big deal. And so, before I give you that, I'm going to give you some background, then we're going to pray. The Jews have been looking for a Messiah for how long? A long time. They, like we do, had studied their Old Testament, and they had structured what they believed was what the Messiah would do. There's over 300 prophecies concerning this Messiah that's going to come. They've been written from a thousand years ago to a hundred years ago in their time. And they studied it like a lot of Christians study our end time prophecies about his second coming. And in their studies they had formulated because man often comes to the Bible with his perceptions and let's just be honest with you, their take on what God should be for them. And the Messiah was going to come as a military leader and bring peace by strength. Israel was going to be the center of the world. And listen, God was going to bring economic and agricultural bounty to Israel and the world through this Messiah. He's going to be the one that's going to fix all the problems that's what this is going to do. And so they were looking for him to come as a military leader, a strong man. And they were waiting and expecting it. And they're under the impression, the oppression of Rome. So they're really looking for some hope that God's going to come through. Listen, how many of y'all, let's just be honest Christians, how many of y'all do this? Man, I wish Jesus come tomorrow. Things, get, yeah. <laughs> Things are just so bad. I'm a little mixed. I'm going to hurt some feelings today. That would be great. But I got lost loved ones I'm praying for. I hope he takes a little bit more time. Is that selfish? Maybe so. But how many people does God want to be with him in heaven for eternity? Oh, it's his will that none should perish. But we talked about last week. Everybody's going to make a choice. The Jews were waiting with that kind of hope. And that's what they're looking for. But Jesus did something they weren't expecting. He said, you need to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, but your hearts are not right. You're not seeking God. Your lips are all about God, but your hearts are far from him. And they didn't like that message. It kind of sounds like our people today, doesn't it? We want the blessing, but we don't want to change kind of like our country. So before we get started, we're going to ask God to bless the reading of his word. 
and to, and to help us understand some things we may have never thought about. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we can come and worship and spend time together. Father, I do thank you every Sunday morning. There's, there's talking and laughter and, and movement. But Father, I pray that you would help us to be still and to hear, that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, that you would help us to see what you're doing through Jesus Christ. It is not a lifestyle to be lived. It is a understanding of what he has done and a transformation of our heart and our soul and our mind. So, Father, help us to see bigger things. Help your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and help to set the captives free, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look with me at verse 28. They're getting ready to go into Jerusalem. It says, And when he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he, talking about Jesus Christ, he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord had need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus. They threw their cloths or coats, cloaks on the colt. And they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. You got remember, there's over a hundred, I mean, a half a million that are coming for this pilgrimage. And there's word all over the place that this man has raised him from the dead. And now he's coming in riding on a colt. Okay, you with me so far, church? Verse 37. Then, as he was now drawing near to the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. They'd seen him give sight to the blind, feed a multitude with very little, heal people of leprosy, the paralyzed can walk, and a dead man rise from the dead. And they're expecting who? The Messiah. And with it, peace on earth and blessing and Israel is going to be set up to be center of the world. They're excited. Look what they do. So the multitude of disciples began with the rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king. They see him as the Messiah. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. In some of the other Gospels, there's four Gospels, they all give an account. What, what else do they sing? Does anybody remember? Hosanna, Mary, and you'll get an iPod from Skipper as well. Just wonderful <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Joking, Skipper. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What does Hosanna mean? Huh? Salvation now. Yeah, salvation now, Lord, save us now. There's a lot of different translations, but it's a salvation cry. And they are excited. And this is called, we call this Jesus' triumphal entry. Now, as he's riding down, they're throwing their clothes and they're throwing these on the ground. And they're praising and they're shouting and it is loud and it is big and it is awesome. Now, we don't know what a triumphal entry is, but they did. In Rome... If you were in charge of a legion or you were a general or you were a fighter and you killed 5,000 of the enemy, you earned a triumphal entry and they would celebrate you. They would set you up in a gold chariot where you would come in with these big horses. You were put in the chariot and you would roll in and behind you were the treasures and the trophies and the animals of the region that you just conquered. 
Your soldiers were behind you. It was a big parade, a big fanfare. And at the very end of it, the enemies in chains that were captured and weren't killed are dragged and displayed for everyone to see. This is what happens to the enemies of Rome. It was a big deal. So why would people call this the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ? And listen, he's on a colt, a donkey. There's something different. When you get up on a horse, mm, when you get on a donkey, <laughs> now we lose some of the symbolism, but see, back then, if you came in on a colt and you were a king, you were declaring peace to the place you were coming into. It was a sign of a treaty, if you will. You came in on a horse, it was showing that you had power and you were a threat. You were letting them know. So Christ is riding in as the king, coming in peace. And listen, he's going to triumph over something we couldn't. If you've been here for our Roman series, triumph over sin and death. But they're not aware of this. He's been preaching it. He's been talking about it. They're saying he's coming to kick Rome out, set us up. They're pumped. The Bible says in Romans, we've been doing our series in Romans, it says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though a good person someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And they recognized this too. Listen, this was in the prophecies, but they got it all twisted. Hosanna, Lord, save us. Save us from what? Sins. Death. From our selfishness. They weren't singing Hosanna for that. They were singing Hosanna for what? Save us from Rome. Save us from being stepped on. Save us so we can be top dog. And they're shouting this and shouting this. They're publicly proclaiming Jesus is the king. Now the religious leaders have a little problem with this. They're picking up on this and they don't like it one bit. They know the Bible and they know the prophecies and they knew what Zechariah said about what's happening. Zechariah 9.9 9 says this. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Righteous and victorious, that's who he is. But victorious over what? His first coming is about saving us. Does anybody know what he rides on the second coming? Say it. Charge your horse. Game over. I'm coming to conquer the next time. Those who bow the knee, they will be with me forever. Those that reject me, we will deal with them. But he's coming in peace because God has sent his son into the world to bring peace between us and him. Do you see how they're missing it? They're twisting it. This is what people had taught them. It's what they heard. Verse 39, the Pharisees are just furious. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Let me tell you who a Pharisee is because some of us don't know. There was different schools of students of the Old Testament of Judaism. There were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the conservative, high view of Scripture. They're the ones that we would probably side with, to be honest with you, but they were very legalistic, very judgmental, and had no connection to God. They knew the right things. They knew the right theology. Even Jesus said, do as they say. Don't do as they do, though. They had it right here. They didn't have it right in their heart. The Sadducees were a little bit more liberal. Well, God's Word really doesn't mean... I mean, God's Word is written by men. The Pharisees said, oh, no, no, no. God's Word is written by God through men. Sadducees said, well, you know, it's not, and it's just all kind of mythological. It's symbolic. Um, there is no spiritual stuff. There's no real angels. There's no resurrection. It's just to help us get through life. Pharisees would go, I cannot believe you. You're so little of faith. The resurrection's real. It's and, and they went back and forth to each other. The Pharisees and the Sadducees both came against Christ, but the Pharisees were the worst. 
and they knew their Bible, and they knew what this meant, and they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Verse 40, But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And then Jesus says something that is just weird. Listen to what he says, verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. There's only two places Jesus weeps, and this is one of them. And he wept over Jerusalem, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, talking about the city of Jerusalem, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Now here's the reason. Underline it. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. He holds this nation accountable for missing what is happening. He said earlier, I just read it to you, especially in this your day. Jesus came on this day. On the Jewish calendar, the, Jewish, the Jews and Judaism during this time used a lunar calendar, which is very interesting. I kind of like the lunar rather than the, the, I call it the solar calendar one we use. We have how many years, I mean days in our year, Sam? 300 and, 365. And a Jewish calendar is 360. It's a different cycle. And they break their days up into quarters or watches. There was a man who read this, and he knew that Jesus came on the 10th day of the month, the Jewish month, Nisan. Now, I said that right. It doesn't mean a Nisan car. Jews had a, a month called Nisan. This event happened on the 10th day of that month. The man who read this and took that word day was somebody that had worked on the case of um, Jack the Ripper. He was the head of Scotland Yard. He was a very, just a great investigator, and he was a Christian. And when he read his Bible, he not only meditated on it, he would investigate it like a detective would. When he saw this day, this day, it caught him. And because you did not know the time of your visitation, he said something in his head, it clicked. Why did Jesus say that? It's kind of weird. Because we see it as they recognize him as Messiah, right? He sees it as they did not. And he said, because you didn't know that today was your day and that I was coming to visit you on this day, you will now not even understand it. No peace. And your city's going to be destroyed. That's kind of harsh, isn't it, Janet? There's a passage in the book of Daniel. This man's name is Sir Robert Anderson, and if you ever want to read his book, he did a study and investigation on the book of Daniel. It's called The Coming Prince. you got to remember, this was written way back in the day. But he's a genius. He's reading through Daniel, and he comes across the statement, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel has been praying, how long are we going to be in captivity? And God tells him, look, you got 70 weeks. Now, in the Hebrew, there's, there's timekeeping and things we're not used to, and I'm not going to get into all that today, but a week is different than our week in this passage. And then he says something very interesting. Verse 25 of this passage I'm reading from Daniel 9. Know therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks of 62 weeks. He read that and said, look, look at that. There's going to be a command given to restore to build Jerusalem. And then God gives us the number of time from when the Messiah, the Prince comes. So Sir Robert Anderson began doing some investigation. He took the 363. He figured out it was about 483 years. He did the math. He came up to, I think it was 177, 173,880 days. He took it from March the 14th, 45 B.C., to the time, so he, that he knew the time when the command was to, to rebuild Jerusalem. He took that date and this did the math. And guess when the Messiah Prince comes? The 10th of Nisan. That year, when Jesus rode in. They should have known he was coming, and they didn't. They missed it. Listen, God told them, this is when the Messiah is coming. And they missed it. And that's why Jesus says on Palm Sunday, because you did not know this day, your visitation, no peace. I thought about that this week. I thought about it a lot last night. There was over 300 prophecies when people want to argue if there's a God or if Christianity is true, there's a lot of great arguments, but there's one that I found is locked in. I haven't seen anybody argue it. They don't even debate this among the atheist circles because the argument is too strong. One of the things God says in his word that he wants us to know, God doesn't want us to guess, he wants us to know. Let me say that again. God doesn't want us to guess, he wants us to know. He says, one of the ways you're going to know that this book, these words, are something more than just a man book. There's a lot of Christians that say that, and it angers me, because it shows me two things. I don't mean, if, if I hurt your feelings, so be it. It tells me they haven't studied, and they haven't researched, and they're a little ignorant. But whenever I hear somebody say, well, this is just a book written by men, and there's a lot of problems with it. There's a big problem with that statement because God says the way I'm going to prove to you that this book is true is I'm going to declare things that have not yet happened as if they did. And I'm also going to declare things that will come to pass way before. And it's going to happen just like I what? So over 400 years before Jesus rides in, God gives them something to look for and they missed it. And they missed it partly because they were looking for God to deliver them in a way that was not the way he intended. There's going to be a second coming. Do you all agree with that, church? Do you know he's told us what to look for? Did you all know that? He said, look for this. When you see this, don't worry. And look for this. When you see this, let not your heart be troubled. And when this happens, don't worry. And when you're handed over for persecution, don't be afraid. And when you go into the courts to testify, don't worry about what you're going to say. But when you see this happen, look up because I'm coming. It's in Matthew 24. Boom, 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 boom. Just like in Daniel. But we also have a misconception about Christ. Christ. And it's a, it's, I hate to say this, it's an American thing. Y'all ready? Christians aren't supposed to suffer a whole lot. It's not true. We're not going to go through any of the hardship. My Bible says there's going to be a great persecution before he comes back. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Larry, you're supposed to build us up and make us feel good before we go home. I am going to make you feel good because here's the thing. All the things we're seeing in the world right now, God says is going to happen. And they're happening just like he said. So should we be depressed and scared or pumped up and excited? 
we should be pumped up excited, but part of us is afraid. We worry about our kids. We worry about the future. We worry about those things. But just as that came true, and just as Christ raised from the dead is true, and just all the promises that he made is true, he says, though you will suffer a little time in this world, the glories that are to come, your suffering is nothing compared to those things. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, or even entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for you. And if I leave, I'm going to come back, what? For you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Do you know how special that is for y'all as Christians? Jason, he knows exactly what your heart's desiring. When you see the place he's prepared for you, I think you're going to be blown away. How long did it take God to make the world? He's been gone a long time preparing a place for us. And that's not even the big thing about it. The big thing is we're going to be in the presence of God and enjoy his presence. And just as those prophecies came true, think about that for a second. 500 years to the day. A thousand years before that, he predicted the guy that would make the declaration to, to fix Jerusalem. And that came true. He told how long it would take to do it, and that came true. He predicted 333 different prophecies about Jesus Christ, and all of those came true. And I'm listening to, I'm, I'm a nerd, I'm sorry. I'm listening to, I never thought I'd hear this in my lifetime. I listened to the world government forum this week. Let me say that again. The World Government Forum. You want to know what they said? Don't get scared. We need to move currency to a digital currency with a one world bank. That was predicted thousands of years ago. We are going to have to figure out a digital way to track everyone to make sure that it is done rightly. That was predicted a thousand years ago. They, de they declared it. They're not even scared. They're not even hiding it. We need to form a new world order in the next few years. That was predicted. But what else did God predict would happen? We would see a great move of God. The gospel's going to go out with power. And we will be taken up and away with him at his second what? Coming. And just as everything else has come true, this is going to come true what? Two. And he tells us, do not lose heart. Do not fear. Don't worry. Because I got you. Y'all get this from me a lot, and it's my kind of mantra. You ready? You've got this. Because he's got you. And Palm Sunday was a reminder, not just for the Jewish people, but for us, that when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And he offers us peace as well. And how do we have peace with God? We've been studying it. Through who? Jesus Christ. If you're here today, listen, I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. I don't believe in that. That's manipulation. But I'm telling you the truth. There's things that are coming together, and, he's, and God says, look, it is my will that none should perish, but all have everlasting life. And Christ came into the world. I quote it to you all, Tom. Let's see if you all can do it with me. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but through him he might save it. And so what Easter is about is God keeping his promise that I am going to save you if you put your faith in me. Next week we're going to talk about the resurrection because the resurrection was God's promise that what I said is true and what Christ did is true. And because of that, we can walk in newness of life. Amen? Amen. Palm Sunday is a hard Sunday to preach. You can't preach about the leaves too much. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff in there. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we leave today. Father, I get excited when I'm listening to things and seeing how things are unfolding. Because you told us what to look for and we're starting to see it. And that is awesome. It reminds us that you're in control. 
It reminds us what you said to us so many thousands of years ago. I know the plans I have for you. It is not to harm you. It's to give you a future and a hope. Not just in this life, Father, but the one to come. We forget that this life is a staging ground, Father, and forgive us for that. We get so caught up in the now, we forget about the everlasting future. And Father, I pray that all of us would come to know the peace that your Son offers, a peace which surpasses understanding. And it's not by what we do, it's by what Christ has done for us. So I pray this Easter, Father, especially next Sunday, that you'd help us to understand all that your Son did, that we can have peace with you. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for men that study it so diligently and open up these great truths for us and help us to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. We're going to close with, uh, there's a Redeemer, and we're going to stand and sing. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, or you don't know what Christ has done for you, that'd be a better way to say it. Come talk to me. You can grab me after church. I won't embarrass you, but I want to explain to you what Christ has done for you so you can have that peace. Let's stand and sing, there is a Redeemer. Thank you, Scott.